Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, first little uh, podcast or whatever you want to call it these days. <laughs> I'm joined today by uh, Martin Jonasson, also known as Grapefrukt. Uh, hello Martin. Hello. So some of you might know Martin from games like, he has, he has made games like Hold Down, uh, Grimmed Capsule, Two Fold Inc, and most recently Subpar Pool. Uh, and uh, Martin does the programming, design, and graphics for those games. And um, Martin is also in the indie game, you know, like in the game dev community, uh, maybe a bit famous for his juice it or lose it talk he did together with Petri Puro. Uh, so you might recognize him from that as well. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna take some time here just to talk a bit about everything, you know, indie game dev related. It can be some programming, some design, some uh, art stuff. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. Anyways, uh, happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's always, uh, always fun to talk shop. Talk shop, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, w I was going to jump into something like uh, that I an interesting question I actually got myself back when I uh, released my game uh, and it was uh, someone asked in a chat to me uh, how do you know that a game is actually done and ready for release say that you don't have a fixed release date yeah. how do you decide when it's done I think for me I can usually tell when I'm getting tired of it <laughs> like because like the way i tend to do projects and i think projects in general is like you have the fun bits and then you have the boring bits that you know you have to do but it's very easy to do them i, I can do them next week and some of it is like you can't like i can't do the final testing of the game until i know i'm not going to change like some things just have to be at the end uh so i know that from the day I decide to like, it's time to start finishing. It's going to take like six months or maybe a year uh, to be done with it. But once I feel like, oh, this, like this goddamn game, like I just want to get it out the door. It's time to start like, okay, it's like, it's time to start leaving sort of. Um, and then I didn't like it's it's a tough call because it's never it's never done right yeah uh there's always something more you can do but for me i feel like it's it's usually my own patience that's the like that's the cutoff like okay i'm tired of this i don't want to spend any more time making this better because i like it needs to go out the door um and i also feel like for every project I've made, the whole like launch thing is becoming bigger every time. Like there's more things to think of. With Subpar Pool, I did sim launch on iOS, Android, Steam, and Switch, which I've never done before. Um, which was entirely doable. It's just like it takes a lot more planning and a lot more padding sort of at the end of the project. Um, and it's challenging, especially with like switch and console builds in general, because they have to be done like ideally six months before <laughs> you launch them, because uh, they got to go through certification and like you got to wait for the cert to be done to be allowed to do some things. And those things will take like another month. Um, so you can't do the Oh, well, let's launch today. <laughs> Click yeah. the button thing that you can do on like Steam and even mobile kind of. Um, yeah, so that, that makes it take a lot more planning and a lot more, it's a lot less sort of, I felt like launching today. So I did. But I was also thinking from, you know, just that feeling of like, okay, the game is done. It, it, it's a, it's a strange, like, because, you know, you, you need to sort of choose the scope of the game somehow and and at some point you're like okay well what's the what what will stay and what will go and what do these things that i skip are they actually are they important like choosing that kind of stuff that's hard yeah and i think 
it's it's a weird thing being like a smaller like a one person team or two person team because it's very like i'll get the idea like oh i want to do such and such like i want to add this feature um and i can't just add well i could just add that feature and oftentimes i'll just do that but like as i'm getting more experience like i've i've done this a bunch of times i realized that it's not just about the feature it's also about like testing it and maybe the worst bit of all doing all the ui and like teaching it to the player so it's not at all uncommon that i would just cut entire features because they're too complicated to explain to the player uh, or like i'll make them hidden features like like it exists but you need like i won't explain it to you you got to find it by yourself um because explaining it, it's just not worth it. Like it's, it's such a, like it's such a sensitive time bringing someone into your game and like messing it up by adding too much text or explanations or anything. Like the less stuff you have there, the better. And sometimes I'm okay with sacrificing like the long term, whatever, yeah. interestingness of the game on account of making the first two hours more uh, hospitable. Yeah, I I had this exact experience with uh, trying to like, I, I, I was trying to make the tutorial for the game. Yeah. And what happened was, uh, it was a hard, it was hard to explain certain things because there was just one thing too many to explain at, yeah. at, at the beginning. And what I ended up doing was cutting one of the features and sort of merging them into another feature. And then suddenly the whole game just felt like, you, just, you know, the kind of like, oh, this is so, this is so nice now. I, the, why didn't I do this earlier? Like I just took, so, I just deleted something from the game essentially. Yeah. And it feels then good the, too. Like I yeah. love that. Like less code, less bugs. Like it's that easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking like uh, so you your games like you have get two of your games uh, hold down and two folding so uh, hold down is this game where you uh, bounce balls around and try to uh, break blocks and dig deeper and stuff and for those who haven't played it it's super it's, that's my favorite grapefruit game by the way hold on it's, it's, i think it's super i think favorite. i think that's the the, the agreed upon best one <laughs> <laughs> not by me but by like judging from sales and just like player numbers yeah uh, yeah there's just something so nice and juicy about the game uh but uh like yeah but like games like hold on and two full link to full link is this puzzle game where you sort of uh, get bigger and bigger numbers by drag like how, how would you explain it uh yeah you've got like a grid of colored squares essentially and you want to drag like you can you can move the the grid around it's mm -hmm. kind of like a match three but it's different so you want to drag between the colored squares and make one consecutive path through an entire area of color um yeah which is called a hamiltonian path for for uh -huh. all the the, <laughs> is it, the graph is it, theory people. is it the path where it doubles or is it the path that you have to visit all the points a hamiltonian inside? path visits all the nodes but it's oh. not uh cyclic like it doesn't uh, join up it, it could but it doesn't need to oh yeah so then, then i actually wonder if we can get back to this question i actually had but so in two folding so you are you like so there are like these fields of colors and uh, you must be able to make a continuous line between all the yeah. uh, we'll probably put some video on the screen of this you need to be able to make a continuous line for all of them and other if you don't succeed it kind of like just shakes a bit when i was playing that uh I was thinking like, oh, I wonder if if he does like a cool mathematical way, or is it like brute force? Like, is checking the no like going through each node and like checking is there yeah, any? Yeah. So it turns out like I was I was just messing with I I stumbled upon this mechanic sort of by accident, um, but it worked out really well. And in the beginning, I was like, wow, this is this is cool. And you know this feeling when you have like. Oh, this has to be a problem someone else has had before. Like, I bet this has a name. And I Google for it and I couldn't find it. So I started solving it. And then I found the name and it's a Hamiltonian path. It's like a node theory or a graph theory thing. Uh, and it turns out it's an NP complete problem. Like there's no, there's no 
easy way to solve it. Like you have to brute force it. Uh, uh, so that's kind of what it's doing. But all I'm interested in is finding like once I, cause th th there's a certain category of shape that's just not solvable. Uh, so like a T piece that has like three lone yeah. tiles, it's just not going to be solvable. So I know if there's more than two lone tiles, I can early out. So there's like a ton of ways I can like discard, like I know this shape isn't solvable. Uh, but that was a fun programming thing is to write that solver and figure out like, okay, how can I do this uh, in the best way? And it, it like, it caches everything it's seen before. Uh, so it's not like, usually the shapes are pretty small and pretty like the same ones will keep showing up. There's a worst case one where it's like the entire grid is one color except for one tile in <laughs> the wrong spot uh, where it takes like, I don't know, eight seconds because it has to try everything because um, it could be solvable, but it's not. Um, but that will like that never shows up in like normal play. I don't even think you could force it within the rules of the game. Uh, but that's like the worst one. That's the one I used for testing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I was looking at it, thinking like, huh, th some of these things might take a while, like be take us some computation time to to figure out. Yeah, and some of them have multiple solutions. A lot of them have multiple solutions, but I don't care. Like, I will highlight it if it has one solution, then I'm yeah. done. Yeah. So that, but that's actually what I wanted to go into. Like, so uh, now we, we talk about two with two fold ink. I was wondering, like, how did the design of uh, two foldings start out, and I guess that's the the answer that you you, you saw these kind of uh, you stumbled was, upon this problem. I was playing a match three game for two folding. I was playing a match three game, and it was kind of like sloppy and weird in the matching. So I was like, I wanna I wanna try this, and I wanna see if I can make it like the way I wanted to make it. Um, and like there's a million match three games, so that didn't seem like fun. So it's like, what if you could drag like long shapes? And then I just what if myself into a whole game? Um. Yeah, so, so 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 I guess in that sense, it's like uh, you knew you you kind of it's like having an idea and, you know, starting out with something is uh, like this is weird period, I guess, like, oh, right now I'm just playing around and then suddenly like, oh, maybe I can make this and ship it. And, yeah. and I, I guess like, how do you have lots of those sort of periods where you're just trying something or do you usually end up stumbling on something and playing with it for a while, for a while and usually it works out and it's something you can ship or are there lots of discarded projects that are just like, uh, yes. Yes. yes, lots, lots <laughs> and lots of projects that seem Cause it's like, I do this full time. So like I have time uh, to do this and I just finished summer pool like last year. Um, so I'm, I'm in that period right now where I'm trying to figure out what to do next. And it's terrifying to start like a multi-year project. Uh, so you don't, you just start a, a, a one week project and then it, it gets one week longer and then one week longer and then one week longer. <laughs> <laughs> um and then sometimes it just doesn't work out like you're it will work great for some small prototype thing like it's a great toy but like figuring out like okay how can i make this work for not 10 minutes but maybe 10 hours um and that's usually where it falls apart um because i can like i can wrap my head around a small thing to be like okay i can I can sort of visualize how this is going to work for the small game and be like, okay, this is probably going to work. But for like the bigger, um, more overarching design of the thing, that's hard. I need to build that first to see if it works. I'm not that smart <laughs> to be able to think about it. Um, and, and in all honesty, I, I actually doubt that anyone is that smart, that they can like figure it out beforehand and like write it down in a document and it'll work. Yeah, uh, seems implausible to me, but uh, there are many things I do not understand. So maybe because you you kind of see all the time, you know, uh, I see on social media people posting like the first prototype or something, and everyone is like, "Oh, it looks super cool!" You know, maybe it's like just a few rooms from a game with a single mechanic, and then you know, many of these games are never shipped or yeah. finished. And sometimes people ask people like, "Oh, but..." 
what happened to this? And they're like, yeah, but it, it, it didn't work out. And I think all of them, maybe, well, many of them ended up in this situation where it's like, oh, it, it just, I didn't know how to make a whole game out of it. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really common and dangerous trap to be like something that works really great as a video on social media, where it's like, oh, sh wow, cool, 30 seconds of cool mechanic. Uh, making that into, I don't know, five, 10 hours or even two hours of a game is not at all the same thing. Like it's very different, uh, especially feels like this like cool puzzle uh 3d platformer like there's a lot of that where you can like make a really cool trick and then it won't carry the entire game for multiple hours you need yeah. 20 really cool tricks <laughs> yeah and there are um, i guess there's many sort of things where you you kind of start out with yourself with like, oh, this is like some neat stuff. And then you try to, and at the end, you know, you also have like, you know, it, it looks nice on a trailer, but the stuff sort of in between there can be like, oh, I'm just panicking, trying to add and remove stuff until something sort of, you know, until it works nicely. And it's something yeah. that people really like to play with. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult to, because sometimes it takes a lot of time to make that and it doesn't work and you have to throw it away. Um, I rarely feel bad about throwing stuff away because I, I'm mad at it. <laughs> <laughs> Go away. This yeah. Like game. this stupid thing doesn't work. So like, I feel <laughs> good about, and like, I still have it in version control. Yeah. So like, it's not actually gone if I wanted it back, but like, it's like, Oh, the thing that doesn't work, I can just like turn it off and, leave it over there in the corner and forget about it. Usually that feels good. Um, I think, um, yeah, cause I don't know, video games, like they're so big, they're, there's so many parts, even in like a small game that the fewer you can get away with, the better it is almost always. I guess there is some balance between, you know, the, the, the most, Actually, the most common problem with people not being able to ship a game is that they always start on a new game. Yeah. But then one also needs to have the opposite thing where you don't keep working on something that obviously doesn't work. And ending up in that sweet spot, I think by then, you know, you've, you've lost a lot of people. And I guess that's yeah. why so games, few games uh, that get started actually ship. Yeah, and it's it's like, it's not just a question of being like knowing when to cut and when to not. It's also like economics. Like, I, can I afford to throw all this away and start over again? Um, that's rarely true. Uh, like, <laughs> oh, I have, like, I saved up to money. Like, I have a year to make my dream game. Yeah. I spent eight months doing the wrong thing and I need to start over. Uh, it's not fun. Um and I like I don't even know what to do in that situation. Like that's not that's bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess you have to. It it's easy to get like tired of your game, I guess, and be like, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. And but then I guess try to push through that a bit. And if yeah. even if you try to push through it and it still doesn't work, then you'll be like, oh, maybe I need to. Yeah, and it's like it's it's a thing that surprised me. Uh, cause I, I did go to school for game design a long mm -hmm. time ago. Um, but even like that was long enough ago that like the whole indie scene wasn't really established. That sort of happened in parallel with me studying. So I never intended to be like a solo developer and I never really considered how much of it is managing my own sort of mental state. Uh, cause if I'm having a shit day, the entire company is having a shit day and nothing's <laughs> getting done. Yeah. Um, and you can only force the entire company to do boring stuff for so long before they quit. Even if it's me, like <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, if I hate it, it's not like, it's going to take a long time to get done and it might not get done at all. 
Um, so figuring out a way to structure your work that you can actually do it. Um, cause it's a lot easier to do it if you don't hate it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's super individual. Like I'm not going to even dare give any advice there, but like, it's, it's something you have to think about. Like you can only torture yourself for so long before you quit, even if it's yourself that's doing the torturing um it it's almost like it's like small small studio or solo dev development is is almost like an exercise in sort of mental health yeah <laughs> because if you have a big studio with lots of people then you can kind of be more brute force like oh we have to get it down and people are like okay and then you yeah. know, somehow it all shakes into place uh, but uh, when when you're alone, everything stops if you stop, and if you do it for too long, like you say, you're you're there be there will be no game. Yeah, and I think that's another thing of just having time. That's super beneficial to be like you can allow yourself to have a sh a shit day or even a a week or sometimes a month. Like yeah, you're not like it's gonna go up and down. You're gonna have really great weeks and you're gonna have really bad weeks um sometimes it's because the game's bad sometimes it's because you is bad you are bad <laughs> uh sometimes it's something else entirely like oh the, i mean we live in sweden like it's night six months a year um it's always super hard yeah it's super hard to tell too like what is it like i have a, a daughter she's nine years old she woke up today and everyone's an absolute idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> have you considered that maybe you're in a bad mood? Uh, she had not considered that. Uh, in fact, everyone else was an idiot. But <laughs> like, it's easy to laugh about yeah. when it's someone else and even maybe when it's a kid. But like, it's, it's a real thing. Um, Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's everyone else. And yeah, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to handle that stuff. So. On the other hand, there's a lot less meetings yeah. uh, and like interpersonal stuff. So I, I, maybe it all balances out in the end. I don't know. Yeah. And I've, it's also kind of like, I, I worked at small studios with like five people. And even at that point we were like, oh, but it's okay. You know, someone, this person is, is like didn't sleep well today and it's totally off uh yeah. he's gonna uh, just not work today uh that's fine uh while if you're like 20 people then that starts becoming like oh why why are you when why am i work you know people yeah. start to grumble or at least the boss maybe starts to grumble uh and then when you're alone you can kind of like yeah i'm, not, I'm just gonna go into the forest and see look for inspiration <laughs> as i call it yeah, and you don't have to explain it to anyone. Yeah. No, exactly. Like... You want it to yourself. Well, you don't have to explain it to yourself either. Yeah. You might try. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, people ask me, like, oh, how do you do about vacations and stuff like that when you're self employed? It's, it's very easy. I just don't go, like, to the you... office or to work. Yeah, I just the, don't show up. This area here, I leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't have to tell anyone in advance. I yeah. just don't go there. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I mentioned at the start this thing about uh, Juicy Games. Like you, yeah. you were in this talk some years ago with Petri Puro called it's Juice It or Lose It. 11 years ago. 11 years ago. I think so. Nice. Well, when, when was, when was, like, was that when you were just starting out? 2012. Your... No, it's 12 years ago. Oh. God damn. Yeah. yeah. Time, time. Because you're, when did you, you released your first? big game room capsule in that was when? 22 13 was that yeah so the, that's the use of lucid talk is even before that this is your i think yeah i, so I, I gotta guess, check this so I guess is it... important facts <laughs> 11 years ago says youtube nice so i guess uh I would say that many of your games sort of are uh, adhere to this philosophy of that you need the juicy graphics where things are kind of there's this there's the things with 
the squ you squish graphics, pitch sounds, shake the screen, deform the screen a bit when stuff happens. That that yeah. to, to make the game just feel better for for arbitrary reasons. <laughs> uh, I guess one could say. So in a game like Hold Down that we talked about before, where where you kind of b bounce balls around and you there is constantly blocks being smashed and you get more and more balls and there's just there's all this crazy stuff going on. I played this game and I I, almost, I thought that of all your games, I think Hold Down is sort of almost like a showcase of the juice it or lose it talk because it's sort of like yeah. because the. I think what's the game you? I haven't watched you to listen in a long time. What's the game? Is it like a uh, it's like a breakout thing. Yeah, yeah. and so it's like, it, in a lot of ways, it's not that far away from Hold Down. Hmm. Uh, but like, but, yeah, the used to do start like that. Where you like that's obviously beyond anything reasonable, just for effect. Uh, yeah, I guess the used to lose the talk kind of it when you're halfway through it that's sort of when you should stop and then you go and then you go crazy to, to yeah. just as then it becomes more of a com comedy thing i guess where you kind of uh, everything just goes mad but in so i i think hold on is sort of almost like a good showcase of this how you can do it in a nice way and i was wondering when i play it like when you have all these different effects where you pitch the sound and uh, and uh, squish graphics and shake stuff do you have like uh when you do the sort of programming of that do you have like uh i don't know what to say like a juicy effect api or like some system that con that keeps track of all this or is it like ad hocly made and just ends up working everything in the end <laughs> 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 no, I, I think it's it's mostly just ad hoc because it's all like a thousand different effects and they yeah. all are very specific for whatever they're doing. Like, I mean, hold down is Unity. So it's a lot of like just like the Unity particle stuff. Um, I have a thing. Hold down has like a funny screen shake effect. Um, yeah, where it sort of. It tilts yeah, because it's, it's like the game is 2D, but it kind of has a little bit of depth. Like it's in planes and it'll, it doesn't move the camera sideways. It sort of tilts it like this. Um, I've had people complain that they get actual motion sickness from, I <laughs> from that I thought it was super screenshot. cool. I was like, coolest screen shake effect ever. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 cool. Uh, I like it. Uh, but yeah, some people really don't like it. But um, you can turn it off. If you if you hate good things, you can turn it off. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and and for me, I really love doing the effects stuff. That's like the the best part for me. Uh, so much so that I have like banned myself from even touching it for the first couple of months of a project. Like I can't. I'm not allowed to do effects because uh, that's all I'll ever do if I <laughs> if I just let myself go. Uh, and usually when I don't know what to do in a project, which tends to be a lot of the time, I'll just do some effects because those are, it's, it's a lot easier to do effects. Like you don't have to think about like, oh, what's the overarching implications of this change? I'm going to blah, blah, blah. It's just like this corner of the game and the code and whatever, I'll do some cool things here. Um. It'll take a day or two or three, and then it's done, and it can stay here, and it doesn't affect anything else. It's very nice to work on. Um, it doesn't get the game more done necessarily, but it looks nice. Um, and I guess it's good to sort of also hold them off for a while so that you don't get too married to your features. Like uh, if you need to cut something, like oh, but it looks so nice. I'm, I put in yeah. all this juicy stuff, and they're like. Uh, it's and it really helps to uh, um, to sort of judge if the game is actually fun or if it just looks like it's fun. <laughs> like you'll give it to people and they're like, oh, wow, this is super cool. Uh, but it's really just like paint on a, on a building that's falling down. Uh, like you can't, it'll delay the inevitable reveal of this game is actually bad. Uh, but it looks like a good game. Um, so you mean, is, is it good to play test early without too much of that to see if the mechanics are fun? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. Uh, but sometimes the whole thing is the juice. Like that's the thing that makes it work. Yeah. 
um there's this like age old thing of i think it's like doom 2 or whatever where the playtesters were complaining that the like the, the double shotgun just wasn't good enough like it wasn't doing enough damage uh, so they boosted the base of the of the sound effects, <laughs> and they were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, that's that good. was everyone's favorite weapon ever." Yeah, and yeah, humans are pretty stupid, like game developers and non-game developers. Like it, you're you're like it's easy to fool yourself and everyone else. So I I prefer not to do the use too early because it's like it's almost a bit too powerful to to mix in early in the project to be like. Um, yeah, it's actually quite funny this thing with juice and stuff because I talked to my girlfriend about it and she 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 just thought it was such a strange word. So I guess yeah. what, what what is a what what if someone asks you what's what's your definition of juicing a video game? I guess they should go watch your talk actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We <laughs> even have the definition in the talk. I think. Ah, Let's see. Bring it up here, so I don't. You know. we'll, we'll link to it uh, wherever yeah. we post this. But a juicy game feels alive and responds to everything you do with tons of cascading action and response for minimal user input. Nice, <laughs> but I think it like the way, the, the ideal way to to like um, the best way to use it is for the. Like you, you put it where the player does something and you want to reward them for doing the thing. Not like in like any in-game currency terms or anything. It's just like you did the thing. I noticed that you did the thing. Keep doing the thing. Um, that's it, really. Um, I, and even I, like in the talk, we, uh, we refer to like Emily Short has a thing uh she's a uh, what you call it like she writes like text games um narrative games uh and even in that context where there's there aren't any graphics it's just text well you can have the juice thing where like you try to do something and the game will be like i i see what you tried to do can't do it but like i i have noticed you um yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess it can sort of be used as a, like when you have something in the game that's already important and you've tested it and like okay this is a fun mechanic I guess it almost becomes like a multiplier like this now this thing is even like if if you just put it on to something arbitrary that's not that important then it just becomes this oh this game looks nice but yeah. you know it, it okay but I think when it's really kind of adds a lot is when this this is the one of the most important things that happen in the game and the player maybe already knows it but now they really know and it just yeah. feels good to do that so it's like a multiplier of how nice it is. Yeah, one of my feels. one of my favorite like using tricks is what I I, I have named them sausages. Uh, twofold uses them a lot so when you score there's like a little a line that sort of goes whoop up to the the score counter or whatever mm -hmm. it changed which looks cool uh, and it's it's super good to clarify like a thing happened here that affected the thing over here uh, so useful really good um, you can do it with particles too like just have them swoop up to the score counter or whatever uh, very useful very uh, it's good for everything <laughs> it's it that almost becomes like an an, an imp implicit tutorial over time because people like even if they haven't noticed that ui element where the score is they will notice it maybe not the first time second but maybe notice the third time when it happens yeah. or something uh, and i i think it's, it's a very interesting idea of just taking something from the sort of game world in the on the screen and moving it to the ui and doing that sort of yeah. like to, to make people notice like what what's the connection between the game world and the ui really uh, and it doesn't even need to be the UI. It could be between things in the game. Like you can do it anywhere. It's great. So useful. <laughs> Everyone should do that. So I downloaded two of your games on PC. I think it was Rimmed Capsule and Hold Down. And I noticed that they are tiny, like un un under 100 megabyte, which is yeah. in these days considered tiny. 
uh, I know that like so one of your things is that you like making games that are like uh, driven by simplicity I guess in some sense uh, but is, is the small size of the game here is that is that part of your idea that you're trying to keep the size down or is it simply a byproduct of it like you maybe you don't use so much textures or something because you a lot simple of it graphics. is that uh, I think Ilium capsule is the one one texture um which like there's no point to having one texture uh it just happened to be that way um also rim capsule is like more than 10 years old at this point or yeah yeah um uh, back then phone games because it was like a mobile game at first like ideally you would keep it under like 25 megabytes yeah um it is bigger now because I changed it's like it's it's running on Unity now. So Unity is like, I don't know, 25, 30 megs. Just an, an empty Unity project will be that big. Uh, and then like 90 something percent of it is music and sound effects. Yeah. And then there's nothing else. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's uh, I can just also say that uh, we'll probably throw in a video of Rim Capsule, but I guess uh, it it's this kind of it's your first game is this kind of tower defense rts with tetris stuff yeah kind of. hipster starcraft people who call it <laughs> hipster. No. and there's monolith so it feels very 2001 or something yeah uh, i like that uh but uh what was i gonna say here that uh, the um i don't remember what i was gonna say That's i fine. can tell you that twofold is probably even smaller because it doesn't have textures at all uh like it's all vector graphics um and, and the font is a ttf they use load in or something yeah yeah um yeah i think yeah in the in the unity because i i ported dream capsule and twofold to use unity because they were getting really old in the tooth and people do still buy them and play them some uh so just to like stay up to date with the world um i moved them to unity um so now it actually uses like a sdf font i think so it's not it's no longer pure vector but i think yeah assigned distance field is fine by me yeah i i think many people think about what's stored on disk uh, not what like even if you generate a bitmap front from a ttf yeah, and you use that, and people will still be like, "Oh, but that, what's stored on disk is still just you know, just not textures." But, but yeah, so I and guess... like I care, you obviously yeah. care, nobody else cares. Like yeah. it's not, it's not important at all. Yeah, but it's a few people will be like, "Oh, the game is under hundred megabytes. That's very cool." <laughs> and it, it's true, like the stuff you say about music, like you can have, you can have your the tiniest that you can have your the tiniest game ever like it can be under two megabytes your game and then suddenly it's like you maybe you made ever you made you coded it in c and you made everything yourself and you're like ah it's so tiny i'm just yeah. gonna add some music now and unless you use like a tr you know tracker with, yeah. with like sample based tracker music unless you do that your game is gonna grow beyond 10 or 20 megabytes uh, very quickly like it, i mean i don't know it's like five megabytes per music track <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like there's there's like as long as you're under like i don't know 100 200 megabytes like it doesn't matter um like the i don't know everything's so big now the, the my graphics drivers are like 800 megabytes i don't know yeah. what they put in there um, probably three different versions of electron or something for different winds <laughs> <laughs> i don't know uh and like phones like everything has so much store like it doesn't matter yeah but it I, I think it's nice that people like some people still try sort of to to keep things small i mean it's just a nice uh, it warms a few nerds hearts <laughs> i guess that's nice you, yeah, you... with the uh, with rim capsule had a funny thing too because it like again it's so old you can only back then at least you could only play one like hardware decoded music track like you could play an mp3 file Hmm. and the hardware in the phone would take care of it and like playing multiple tracks would like be work for the device uh but 
I needed, because Rim Capsule has an ending, like an ending animation, uh, and I needed to synchronize like the visuals with the audio, and it just wouldn't work with the compressed audio for some reason. So it's an un for the longest time, it was an uncompressed wave file, like a minute long. <laughs> uh, so the game was like 40 megabytes, and that wave file was like 25. <laughs> Shipping solutions. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I think we, at some point we, we made it mono because like, I, I, I don't know, I feel bad about having this be stereo. Cause like that's half the size immediately. Uh, yeah, now it's unity. It's all compressed and good and probably about the same size, but it's a decade later. So. So I guess that's an interesting thing then, because you used to like room capsule, I think. Maybe this is a twofold link as well, but I know Rim, Rim Capsule was made using Hacks, which is this uh, multi-platform programming language. I think it's inspired by Flash. The, is yeah, it? it looks like very, very similar to ActionScript three. Because I guess you do. Do you come from like the like? Did you mean your early early games were those like Flash games? Yeah, yeah Because yeah. It, it, you have some kind of vector graphics feel to your games and i guess like you said many of them use vector graphics uh, uh, and uh, yeah i'm a i'm a flash flash boy born and raised <laughs> <laughs> before adobe owned it even um og flash yeah uh such a cool piece of technology like a lot of things you could do with that um i mean it, again when i studied uh at university many moons ago like in 2006 i would do prototypes like a, a a prototype a week and i would publish those and i would get hundreds of thousands of people to play those shitty little games that i made and put up on websites because you could do that that wasn't like oh he's so popular blah 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 you just like free games on the internet were that popular like it was entirely doable to get that many plays you'd never make any money from it actually it would probably cost you money because of hosting <laughs> and stuff but uh even then like so long ago <laughs> before phones before everything like web games were really a thing and they were really popular um and people would just play any garbage <laughs> yeah i kind of almost miss those flash game websites <laughs> because you i think it's also sort of like Maybe it's also because I was a kid or something, but you kind of go into it and it's like, oh, I'm just going to fun a fine game. And it is fun for 15 minutes, but that's yeah. fine. Now people are always like, you know, hunting, like, oh, does this, this uh, worth my, I need five hours or something. Yeah, but it, it's just it kind of to... like the free to play thing is kind of back to that. Like you have infinite choice. You don't even have to think about moving to the next game. Usually games will even have like ads for other games in them um which is very similar to the flash days like if there's the slightest roadblocks play will just move, players would just move on um yeah but it, like back then there was a thing called stumble upon do you yeah do you know this yeah so like it's a like a, a toolbar you put in your browser that just had a button for like next thing <laughs> give me uh, things yeah um and it, yeah, it's just like a social media thing. Like you could submit, submit stuff and like vote stuff up and vote stuff down. Uh, but yeah, so like there's just a button in your web browser that will take you to the next fun thing. Um, who needs the who needs the uh, algorithm social media feed when you have stumble upon? No, I, I mean arguably that's also an algorithm, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um. But oh yeah, I was asking about hacks because so you, you you used hacks for Rim Capsule, and I didn't know you had is 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 the the version of Rim Capsule that's on Steam is that ported from Hacks to Unity? Or I is... think the I gotta remember it's I don't know if I update it because the Windows version, the old version, still works perfectly ah. fine. So it's possible that I just left it. Uh, the yeah. Mac version died in the 32 64 bit switch so that one uses the new one the mobile version uses the the unity one but because it's hacksy and hacks has this like cross compiler thing 
um, it will like the, the thing Haxi does, it'll, it will compile Haxi code directly to ActionScript 3 bytecode, which is not relevant anymore, but like what would go in an SWF file. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can also output other programming languages. Like it will transpile the source code to another programming language. So porting to things is really easy because you don't have to interface with anything. I will just generate C sharp from the Primed Capsule source code. Uh, and I will like that assumes like an action script like API. So I code the action script like API in C sharp in Unity as I would code anything. Uh, and I don't even have to do like externs or any of that crap. It's just like it's C sharp. Like it'll just find the things and it will work easily. Uh, there are some annoying bits like Haxi doesn't have, it has null, like null is a big thing in Haxi. Like everything can be null, like everything's an object. So some things don't exactly map one to one. Uh, the generated source code is a little bit annoying to read. There's a lot of parentheses and like belt and suspenders type things where it's like it's just making extra double sure that it works the same way. <laughs> um, but in general, it's really easy to port. Um, it helps too that it's not using that much of the API. Uh, it's like playing sound effects and drawing things to the screen and nothing fancy, but um, I think I did the Rim Capsule and the twofold Unity ports in like a couple of months. Like it didn't take long at all. Um, I guess that shows sort of some kind of, it's a nice showcase of when, when it's beneficial to have this sort of small API, like small API surface for, for whatever, tool or thing you're using because it yeah it makes it i mean this wouldn't have been possible i guess maybe you would not have even tried if it was like hooking into every, i mean maybe for example porting a unity game to smarter engine oh, yeah. then it's like oh, yeah. okay uh you know if it if it's a full unity game without with all that poking everywhere in the engine then you might be in trouble yeah and i, I feel like flash and unity and i would assume every game engine that has like an editor sort of encourages you to like go bleh, <laughs> like spread yeah. things everywhere that don't have any real order to it, which is useful, but it also makes porting things really, really hard. Um, I think especially with, with Unity, sometimes I miss the ability to be like, because if you're coding in like C or like any like custom game engine, you can always insert yourself anywhere in the, like the call order of things like oh shit i need to read this config file before the game starts you can just be like stop everything <laughs> read the file and then okay keep going yeah. in unity you can't really do that unless you thought of that before because everything would just initialize however uh, but unity has a lot of benefits as well so like it's just a trade-off yeah it's the reason you moved from Haxi to now I, I I pronounce it Hax. I never said the word. I think is it supposed to be called Haxi? Or is that I can't remember. Okay. But yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I was like Hax. Uh, no, but uh, in 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 Haxi, do you do you miss like I guess it was lots of uh, technical reasons why you wanted to port them to make sure that they ran on modern system stuff. You I mean you yeah. mentioned the Mac stuff. Uh, is there anything you miss from making like because you now you've made games from scratch in i mean you made games in unity now uh, yeah. I, I guess your two latest games were made completely in unity yeah uh, which is hold um, down and subpar pool is there anything you miss from haxi when working like that because i guess in haxi you had sort of a more uh, there's, there's less tools everywhere that you yeah. look into and more kind of just code i guess yeah it's more code you <laughs> Like it's the whole stack is open source. So you can like, if you need to change it, you can. The drawback is you will need to change it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it back then. And I think even still, it's not like, it's a, it's a hobbyist tool, which is fine. It's good. It's really good, but it's not made for like professional level production stuff, which means and it's not like it's an open source thing. It doesn't get tested 
by anyone except for the people who are using it, and that's me. Uh, so like, oh, when when Android or like Google Play is like, oh, we want to feature you, they have like a special list of like requirements that you need to fulfill, which is like a platform stuff, reasonable things like, oh, the back, back button on Android needs to work, like it needs to do the the expected thing. And OpenFL just did not have, it, it, it worked at some point in time and then just stopped working. And I had to like recompile the entire engine and all the dependency, like, like a multi-day trip into C++ land. And the engine is C++, Android is generally Java. Uh, you write the code in Haxi. So like you got at least three programming languages going on. Uh -huh. like, uh, and you can do it. It's just very, like, it's a lot of work. Uh, and the reason I switched to Unity late, I was a very late switcher um was that it's so much easier like there's so many more people using unity I, it's it is realistic that i could open my office window and shout for help with unity and <laughs> someone who could help me would hear me uh I, granted i live in like a game dev city but like it's it's that popular like it's that common uh, and for openfl and with haxi if i needed a special library to do something like cloud saves on ios uh, i'd have to write it myself or really try and find someone that I could pay that would write it for me. Uh, with Unity, like there's a thousand ones already made. Half of them are free. Some of them are paid. Like there's so much to, like there's just a much more vibrant living uh, community. And it's C-sharp. Like there's a bajillion libraries for C-sharp uh, that will do all the things you need, um, which is not the case for Haxi. Like there's a lot of them, but not that many. And also like I stepped off the Haxi train in what, 2000 and... <clears throat> 16? Yeah. Like a long time ago. <laughs> so I don't know what it's like today. I don't know that. Yeah, if it's, if it's, if it does, maybe, it, maybe it's super nice now, who knows? Yeah, maybe. Maybe maybe soon we're all making hacksy games. I do like the programming language. It's a cool programming language. Um, it, sort of that, and it's sort of they've sort of replicated action script, right? Like you said. Yeah, that was the original like use case. Um, they are called Motion Twin, I think. Uh, who also are, are a game studio. Like fairly recently, they made. What's it called? Motion Twin. I am. I'm not googling this. Our games. Dead cells. Ah. So the same people <laughs> made dead, dead cells, which I so think is Haxi as well. It's not OpenFL, but it it does use Haxi, the programming language. Ah, uh, because I think I've you know dead the dead cells. I think the editor LDTK that is like a grid based level editor. Yeah. I think that's made by the dead cells devs, and. Unless I'm wrong, that now now I have to check this. Now now we're just maybe yeah. It it's an, a free open source editor that everyone likes. You know, it's sort of like the new the new uh, generations tile ed. If you remember tile ed, the yeah. tile based editor, and now everyone loves LDTK. Uh, I, uh, They're I also uh, a cooperative, which is pretty unusual and cool. Nice. Um, so I guess one f can do one final thing here. I was just wondering about like your creating art. You do lots of vector-based art. I, I guess your latest game, Subpar Pool, which is uh, a kind of combination of pool and golf, sort of. Yeah. Uh, I guess that one, when I play it, uh, it has slightly more textures and stuff yeah, going on than the earlier games. Because I didn't do the art for that one. I had, yeah, you had an art director. Yeah. Yeah. So that was art direction and stuff. Um, yeah, I've been I've been wanting to do more painterly stuff for a long time, uh, and there are two challenges with that. Uh, one is like nice straight lines, easy to render, like from a technology standpoint, and I can do those. 
<laughs> so to make this happen, I needed to figure out the the tech to do like the the squiggly lines on everything, because uh, like Sumper Pool is actually three D. The balls are like geometry, like three D circles or spheres. I guess we, the term. Was, is. I guess there's some shader on it to make it feel two D ish. Yeah, uh, and for the longest time, I was like, oh, man, I can't do the, the squiggly outlines on the balls. And then I finally figured it out. So it's like a it's like a rim light shader. So it fades the ball out as the like the normal points away, like the exact same way you do rim lighting. But instead, I fade it to like a noise texture and I tone it down. Uh, so it wouldn't work for many other shapes, but it's perfect for the spheres, <laughs> uh, which was all I needed. Uh, and then everything else is like a whole mix of a thousand different tricks to make it look like it was like drawn, um, which is hard. It's really hard and it's really challenging to, to make it work in motion because it's one thing to like a single frame that looks good, but like a, a scratchy, like pencil drawing on a rough paper, it doesn't move. Like that's not, yeah. Like there's no movement in that and you don't want too much movement because it gets really, really noisy and weird, but you need some movement to sort of sell. Yeah, it's, it's tricky and I still haven't a hundred percent figured it out. Um, it turns out too, that it's super dependent on like screen size and screen resolution and like display density essentially. Um, so I got to like figure out like what kind of screen are you playing on and like scale the noise to match that. Kind of. Is it because otherwise not, you almost get like a moire, like a super noisy, weird pattern and stuff? Kind of, yeah. And like you want, like I, I essentially you want the, the noise size to be, because like if you draw something big, the noise stays the same size. Like if you draw a big circle or a small circle. Uh, but I also want it to be readable when it's small. So I got to make the noise like, it's mm. tricky. <laughs> And like, it's got to work on, I don't know, like a, a living room because it's on switch. Like people could be playing it on their 65 inch TV or they'll be playing it on their iPhone. Uh, and like a 65 inch TV in like landscape mode or like their iPhone in portrait mode. There's a lot of different screen sizes. I feel like two thirds of the subpar pool development time, which is me like resizing the window <laughs> to be like, how oh, does this work for every possible screen arrangement um doing but something yeah. but sort of doing something with more textures like that was the old like your old methods for like getting juicy things into the game was that did that get a bit harder because i guess when you have everything uh, everything in like vector shapes it's easy to squish and go crazy yeah and when it's i think a bit more textures involved for this one there's a lot of like distance field stuff uh which is good because it's more or less resolution independent. Like I can stretch and scale and flip and do things and it will still look good. Um, so uh, most of the illustrations are just flat. Like it's the wallpaper and it's like the cards. Those are like the most illustrative bits. Um, and then the faces on all the balls and all of that. It's like, that's mostly procedural. Like it's based on what Sony drew um but like i re-implemented all of it as like more like tech art <laughs> that i can do all the things with that i need um which is interesting too because like it uh, i'll see if i can find uh, like a screenshot of how it looked before we did the first art pass uh and it's a lot stiffer it's like it's wearing a tie and then <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's it's a that was a fun challenge I'm, i want to do more of that um and it's also really nice to be uh because I've, I've always worked with a sound designer niklas who's yeah. like my my friend as well um uh, we did room capsule together a long time ago and uh, it's so easy working with him because we think the same way uh it's a really funny thing that happened, I think with hold down, we were trying to, to make some, uh, some little effect. I think when you, when you explode the planet at the end, yeah. uh, I would try to make the sound effects work. And usually like, I'll go to his studio where he has like all the gear set up 
Uh, and like I'll have prepared beforehand, like all the sounds we need to do. And like he starts doing them and I'll just sit in the background, drink coffee. Um, very nice way to work. <laughs> uh, and uh, we had this like sound effect for like the, the, the planets or the, the core like exploding and it just didn't work right. Uh, it's like, what the, what the hell's wrong? And then I changed the color of the particle effects from like purple to white. And it was like, yes, that's it. It was a white sound. It wasn't a purple sound. Um, so the sound didn't match the color of the yeah. thing. <laughs> Which is just like, <laughs> that's, that's stupid. And yeah. it was, but that was the correct solution for that particular issue or if it not sounding right. Uh, yeah. And we have like, we have a, a, a good uh cooperation on that to be like okay what's the what's the obvious solution to this problem okay that's that let's not do that let's do the other one um and then sometimes we have to like come crawling back to the obvious one because that's the best one but we'll, at least we'll try something stupid first <clears throat> i guess th that's sort of interesting with because i thought of that one because i, I I've, I've noticed that you you because I think all your four major games, Niklas has been doing the sound and yep. music. And like that cooperation, like especially in sort of these, maybe in moments that require more programming, maybe sort of these moments where you pitch the sound a bit and you also want to it to match very closely to the gameplay. Does, is it like, I guess there's this overlap between that you do some stuff like to the sound, but he take some feedback and like yeah. i guess there's this overlap if you were now starting work. starting with hold down we're using fmod studio which is incredible like such a and for like indie scale projects i don't if you're under i don't your budget's like under five hundred thousand dollars um which it probably is um it's free like you don't like you need to tell them that you're using it but you don't have to pay anything uh, and the way it works is like I set up essentially an event in the code, which is like, oh, the thing happened. Uh, and that will match up with an event in FMOD Studio. It's like a piece, separate piece of software. Um, and I can send along parameters like, oh, the ball is moving. It's moving this fast. It's going this direction or whatever. Like it's this big, any parameter. And then he can... Like it has like a, an editor inside of it that he can like set up like, oh, pitch it this way based upon the velocity or whatever. Um, so usually he can set up whatever the hell he wants okay. <laughs> in the thing. It's a little bit scary because like he can, he can do whatever he wants. Like he can add a <laughs> thousand filters and convolution reverb and all like expensive things. Um, and it's all like sort of black box, uh, but in in mostly a good way because like it just works, and I haven't seen any real performance issues with it. Um, but it's such a treat to be able to like I can set everything up and just send it off to him, and he can make something really cool with it. And sometimes he'll be like, "Oh, this is like I need I need this value or whatever," uh, or I prepare a value for him, and he's like, "I don't need that. I can do it with the other thing." Um, and I guess it shows, in the, I think, because I felt like Hold Down had more. I don't know if it's due to F, like this cooperation using F mode, but it felt like it had a bit more of like uh, there was more small things going on with audio in that one than yeah. when I thought a bit about your previous games. Uh, is, do you, do you think that's due to the? giving the artist more like the sound artist more control using f mode yeah, yeah and and like the the big thing uh just like pitching stuff and like doing filters like i could do that before uh but the thing you can do in f mode that's so much easier to be like to be like you can group things into like a channel be like okay this is the game effects and then you can low pass all of those or like you can send them to an echo and you could do like big sort of I mean, more mastering type things to the audio in the game, which I couldn't do before. Like, oh, you're like you're about to die. Just low pass everything. Mm. Um, or hold down has the thing where like um, where the blocks fall, the the musical slow down, and the the sound effects too. It's like, oh, that sounds really complicated, but I kind of want to try it. And I did it in like an hour. Set it up to be <laughs> like it just worked. Um, yeah, and that's one of my favorite effects in that whole game. Like, it, 
when you figure out, oh yeah, it's it's due to the blocks that are falling, and then whenever you kind of almost in, anticipate that, and it feels good, like oh no, yeah. I'm gonna get the nice uh, slow down sound and all that. Yeah, and it's it it actually sounds kind of bad because the music goes like out of tune a little bit when it slows down, but it's like it's still good. It's still yeah. a good effect. It's, it's for a short period of time. Yeah. It's fine, yeah. and it's, it's like a funny consequence of that like the worm in the corner is he's, he's dancing in time with the music uh but when i slow it down i i sort of lose track of the bpm yeah. so there's a call back from f mod every beat so like he's like resyncing himself to be in time with the music all the time um <laughs> which is like one of the major sources of crashes because it's like calling <laughs> into some C API or whatever. And if that goes wrong, it all explodes. Oh, no. um, but I, I'm keeping it. It's worth it. Okay. <laughs> all right. I think uh, I've had a very nice little hour here. Uh, if Is there... I guess you've you've just released your game some part oh, last year in October or something some yep. part of pool. Uh, I guess people should go check that out. It's a nice game. Or check out your other games like Hold Down and uh, uh, Rim Capsule and what's the last one? Twofold. Twofold Inc. Um, but yeah, anything you'd like to add or think that you? Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. This is weird. It's an like, oh, open question at the end. Yeah, like to yeah. Say something. Uh, I think. Yeah, like... I think in general, keep in mind that nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, my 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 stumbling and bumbling along has somehow worked out. I don't know how that happened. Um, yeah, I think that's I think... reassuring actually, because yeah. people feel like everyone has it figured out, but actually, no one. Has it really figured out? It just happened to figure itself out somehow. Yeah, and sometimes people ask me like, "Oh, Martin, I wanna, I wanna be an indie game developer. I wanna get started. Like, how did you get started?" Well, like, I made a successful game in 2013. That's uh, like that's that's where you should start. That's how. That's the trajectory I'm on. That's the thing I can give you advice about. Uh, so, yeah, and, and I, I guess this. It's not about being like early. You you mean more like it? It's that you can't give advice because you did well in 2014, so you don't know what it's like starting out today. No, right? no exactly that. Like I can, like I have enough successful games sort of under my belt that I can email press and they will read the email, um, which is a huge like benefit. Uh, I don't know if that's going to last forever, but so far it's been. I can I can use it, but I, yeah, it's so different for anyone that's starting out now. I don't even dream to have any smart opinions about what to do or how to do it. Yeah. Okay, but anyways, thank you a lot for joining. Uh, I will link to some of your games in the video or podcast or whatever you're listening, watching this on. So go try those out. And uh, yeah. Thanks for being here. Hey do. Hey do.